Can you, can you hear me? Yeah? Well, uh, hello and welcome to Smart Sheriff uh, Dumb Idea, the Wild West of Government Assisted Parenting. So, we are going to talk about a mobile application that we pen tested twice. Um, we'll go over some highlights from the first and second pen test, uh, pen test uh, reports. And then we'll talk about Smart Dream, which is an application that wasn't in scope at the time, but as a result of preparing this talk, we, we took a look at, and then some future work. And at the beginning of all this, we'll start with some background information so that you, you can see like how all this like started, how something like this could happen, right? So I'm Abraham and he's Fabian. We work for Q53, which is a German company led by Mario Heiderich. And um, yeah, if you are the kind of person that likes reading uh, Pentas reports, some of our reports are public, you can find them here. So and maybe like some of you uh, recognize my name from OWASP for WTF. It's an OWASP flagship project, the offensive web testing framework. So if you are into web app testing, just type OWTF.org on your browser and that will take you to the OWASP page and you can try it. So now Fabian will tell us a story. So we are talking about something that is happening in a country fairly far away from here. Uh, and just so that we don't get any confusion, we are talking about South Korea, not, <laughs> not North Korea. Uh, um, and South Korea is a very special country in terms of um, usage of new media and internet and smartphones. I found here these surveys that uh, show how close to 90% of the total population in North Co uh, South Korea sorry, uh, are using smartphones. And if you look at the young adults between 18 and 34 years old, then it's basically uh, at 100%. For this talk, it would be more interesting to get the smartphone usage of children and minors, teenagers, but I couldn't find a proper survey with sources. But this will show you that this is a country with a very high smartphone usage, and that's why what we will present to you is so interesting and scary. So in late 2014, the South Korean government implemented a new child protection law. It's basically about parental um, protect, protection and monitoring. So they implemented this law in the Telecommunication and Business Act, where they are saying that um, mobile network operators have to provide some services or features to, adult, to provide adult content filtering if they want to do business with uh, legal minors. At that time, it was not very clear how this is going to look like, but a few months later, they added some implementation details where they are describing more how the means of the blocking um, has to look like. So, for example, those details are still very vague, but contain things like that the child and the parent have to be informed about the means of the blocking, and there have to be monthly notifications in case the service is not running or has been deleted. But whatever this law says, in the, it's more interesting what happened than in reality. And it's now the case that South Korea has this mandatory installation of a surveillance app when you buy a phone for a teenager. So if a parent goes into the store and wants to buy a phone, uh, the salesperson will install this um, parental monitoring application on the phone, even if the parent doesn't want to use it, but by law, at first, that is required. And there is no opt-out. The parent can choose not to use it, obviously, maybe even uninstall it, but the default is kind of, we, we put it on the phone to be used by the parent to check on the child. And here's like a, a photo from in front of a Korean mobile store where they inform their customers about the details of this new law what, that they have to install this application and some details about the, the law that we showed before. And this is where MOIBA comes into play. Mo MOIBA, Mobile Internet Business Association, is a company in Korea directly funded by the Korean government developing such an application. So basically the go-to application that is like from a government directly funded to a piece to this, to this law. And they gave them uh, roughly 2.7 uh, million US dollars and along with that are obviously like support hotlines for parents and stuff because what you will see soon is like it's 
crazy how much money you can spend on an application like that. Um, but before we head into the technical things, just quickly to point out how this uh, whole project started, because this was that started by us at Pure 53. It was actually OpenNet Korea, which is a Korean local uh, digital rights, human rights organization that brought this new law that this is happening to the attention of Citizen Lab. And Citizen Lab then did last year in the Summer Institute a project looking at these applications. And we, as an external company, were getting into this as well to provide an additional technical report on this. So uh, these players helped starting this, and the Open Technology Fund also partial, partially funded this whole research. So let's talk about these applications developed by Moiba. Moiba developed actually two applications. One is Smart Sheriff, and the other one is Smart Dream, so the yellow one and the green one. Um, at the time, we were only looking at Smart Sheriff because that is like this flagship application by Moiba, but they also developed another one which has a slightly different purpose. The application Smart Sheriff that we had a look at is about restricting the smartphone usage, blocking apps, and restricting the time a child is allowed to use it. And the other one is about monitoring SMS and chat messaging, which sound a little bit more scary, and we will have some additional info about that towards the end of the talk. And you can guess already that the security of Smart Sheriff is probably very awful that we are standing here today, but I leave you a little bit surprised till the end what is up with Smart Dream. So Smart Sheriff comes in two modes. When you first open it, it, you can choose either if you are the parent or the child. And as a parent, you can look at the usage statistics of your child. You can see how much on average they play games and stuff like that. In the child mode, it will install as a device administrator to obviously have a few more privileges regarding observing the activities on the phone. And it offers three main features. The use time management, you can restrict the usage at certain times, not allowing them to be playing games at night, for example. Or the app management, where you can see what kind of applications your child has installed, and you can deny access to them and blocking them. There's a third tab, the website management, that is actually disabled in like the admin view. But the code is implemented in the application, and the application is acting on um, when, when the child tries to surf and contact certain sites. So the code is still there. So we started preparing for our first round of pen testing. Now the first thing, when you test an application with a beautiful uh, exotic language like Korean, is that, uh, of course, you're trying to use the app, but you know, like all these buttons uh, without us being, you know, not in Koreans, it was like a little bit hard. Like, what does each thing do? Like, how do you how do you analyze all this kind of stuff, right? So, how many of you have done any uh, Android reversing? Okay, not not many. So, basically, when you when you can use this tool, like everybody doing Android reversing uses this tool called APK tool. So, there's a file called strings.xml, and we just took the Korean file, just Google Translate it, get the one in English, and then you can pack the APK again, and then you get the application working uh, in English, right? For the most part. Uh, because, of course, like if the mobile application makes a request to the web server for some HTML that is like returning a normal web page, then we had like to like get it with a man in the middle proxy, then translate that and substitute it so that we can get the English for that as well. But that's one of the problems that we had to overcome. And another one was uh, just to add some breaking points and some debugging messages so that we knew like when certain code was uh, going to be accessed. So when you reverse uh, an APK with APK tool, you get the smiley code. This is the equivalent uh, Java code for that does the same thing, so it's, it's the equivalent. And we just like added some like debugging messages and things like this. And if you are into this kind of stuff, this link at the bottom is quite useful for Dalvik of code, which is essentially like how with the uh, less human intuitive uh, smiley code, how to call like Java things, right? So it's a useful link to have for that. So after all this, like we were ready to start, and the first finding uh, was uh, somewhat interesting because we found this uh, JavaScript interface, right? And a JavaScript interface uh, in Android on all 
Android versions uh, from Android 2.4 to Android 4.1. What it lets you do is it lets you call uh, Java classes from JavaScript, right? And that should like raise a few red flags among you. So uh, essentially this was like code, code execution on all Android versions. And the funny thing is, like they had this JavaScript interface, but they were really not using it for anything. This was probably copy pasted from some beginner like Android tutorial or something. And essentially this was code execution. Now, this is code execution because a mobile phone will always favor Wi-Fi over the mobile network, just because of cost, that there's these restrictions on uh, mobile networks. So you can see like in the, in the code that we showed before, there's like HTTP. And of course, there was like no SSL anywhere. So it was all like clear text, like in this like sensitive application supposed to protect children, like all traffic between the mobile phone to the servers, like in clear text over the network, right? So you could imagine like some bad guy like waiting in the coffee shop for all the children to come out of school, you know, and then just uh, get all the, all the traffic, right? And get remote code execution on the phones because of this. Uh, now, another interesting thing is they were not using SSL, so uh, all the traffic was unencrypted, but some parts of the request, maybe they consider sensitive, so they encrypted only those parts. And you can see here uh, at the left, this is the, um, this is the encrypted phone number, and this is the unencrypted one. Now, any guess as to what algorithm is being used? That's it, XOR. So XOR, but of course, like since this is a mobile application, the key was on the phone, so you can get the key and you can XOR. And you can, XOR is cool because like you can use it for encrypting and decrypting, so you only need one function, uh, you save some time. So uh, maybe that's why, I don't know. But the other cool, the, the, the thing that we'll give to them is that they put some null characters in the key, uh, maybe with the hope that if somebody like that that runs like the string co the strings command on the APK, maybe they wouldn't get the key. So I don't know, it's some speculation on our part. Maybe that's why they did it. Um, and now let me tell you a story. Now this is uh, really funny. Now let's pretend, like this is an app that is supposed to protect children, right? So let's pretend that this, uh, you have like a classroom of kids and there's one kid that is really mean, that he, he really wants to screw up the life of every other child in the room and he's like really mean, like he wants to make the life of other children miserable, right? So Smart Sheriff made an API for this guy, for, for the, you know, for the bully, the, the, the bully guy, you know, like the mean guy. Now this API is really cool for this kind of children that want to abuse others, because I mean, in life, you should always ask questions. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? Maybe you don't get an answer, but you know, most of the time, when you ask questions, like amazing things happen, right? So, and this is an example of this, right? Like you ask smart, the Smart Sheriff API, hey, this is, the, this is the child phone number of the child that I want to mess with. And then Smart Sheriff tells you, sure, this is the parent's phone number for that child number, okay? And then the, the, the bully guy is, yeah, but you know, like to log in, I need the parent number, but I also need the password, like come on, can you give me the password? And then the Smart Chef API says, sure, like, why not? I mean, you know. <laughs> and then, of course, the password is like XOR uh, encrypted, but we saw like we got the key, so you can like decrypt it. And, and yeah, and well, I mean, the password is just like four, car four uh, digits, so I mean, it's not, and there wasn't like any kind of brute force mitigation, so it wouldn't be like very challenging to brute force it after you got the parent phone, but anyway. Uh, so yeah, they invented this API, and of course, because of what we explained at the beginning, that this is an app for phone restrictions uh, and all these things, like if now the, this mean guy in the class can like get access to all the, all the other children's phones, like get parent access to control like when all the kids on the room can use the phone, like which applications they can use, and really like mess with them, right? So uh, technically this is more or less how the request looked like simply like a curl request. And then you can see here like the password uh, that is using the, um, it's encrypted with the XOR and then the parent mobile. And this is, uh, you know, what it looks like. So this is uh, doing the XOR with this, with the key that they were using, it was one, two, three, four. And then this is like the phone number unencrypted and encrypted. 
Now, of course, because there are so many users, you can just keep trying like random phone numbers and start like guessing like parents and parents and children and get the password of the child, the password of the parent, and, and all this, right? Like using the, using the API because it's good to ask questions, you know? You might get an answer. Uh, another potential abuse case of this API of Smart Sheriff is, of course, to fake use, to fake uh, usage, right? Like pretend that a child is like searching for porn so that, you know, the, then the parent is going to get an alert and then the, the child is going to get in trouble, right? But the child hasn't even looked for porn. It's just like the bully is like faking the usage. Now, some API, well, most API endpoints use a device ID but even in our public report, like we were, like in the demonstration, we're just using like words like whatever on the device ID because it didn't matter like what you used. So just with knowledge of the phone number, you could like call most uh, API endpoints with I think a couple of exceptions. And now this is just a section that we called why not? Because I mean, we were like so in shock, like they could get like $3 million and you know, and there's like all this mess of application that we like gave up trying to understand in that. We just saying like, well, why not? You could do it like that, like why not, right? So this is just an example of sloppy coding. Like you would expect uh, that when there's uh, an Ajax login request, like this time like JSON back saying, you know, like you are logged in fine or you are not logged in, some JSON back. So this is the response of the Ajax request, which instead of returning some JSON, it returned like script tag you know, with all the JavaScript, and then depending on the number of tries, like if you were exceeding the number of uh, bad tries, then there's this comparison here, and it will show like a different alert, you know? So it's just an example of sloppy code, like why not? You know, and then another example, like a uh, Tomcat version from 2009, like come on, 2009, so why not? Another example, and then this was uh, also quite funny uh, for the web blocking. Uh, they were using if it contains the, you know, the host name of the Moiba website, then then allow it. Then the filter won't work. Now, of course, you can get something that is blocked and just add a fake parameter, you know, with containing that, and because contains, you know, so you can get this bypass. So it's, it was like really, really broken. And then uh, just to ask other examples like, you know, development snippets everywhere, like revealing like internal IPs, internal URLs. Uh, so in summary, like a big pile of shit. Uh, we found XSS, we found SQL injection on the mobile app, uh, unsafe storage of the blocking history on the SD card, leaking personal data over the API. And just don't take our word for it. I mean, seriously, just our report is public. Just go here and you can like read all the gory details, but uh, you know, that's what happened. And now Fabian will tell us what happened with the responsible disclosure, which is the responsible thing to do, right? <laughs> so we gave our technical report to Citizen Lab, who was in contact with Moiba to do the responsible disclosure. Uh, Moiba in the beginning, also provides some legal threats. That's every good company. That's what every good company is doing when they receive a, a responsible disclosure report, right? Um, but in the end, they agreed and they gave them some days time to fix it. I think it was like 45 days or something like that. And then Moiba started to react on that. They started fixing and pushing updates of the application and releasing press, re press releases informing their customers about those updates. So here's the first one where they say that they continue to improve the security now by moving to SSL and no credits were given to Citizen Lab or what the issues were. They like, make it a bit sound like they discovered this and they improve on it. A few days later, another update, which was actually quite surprising because now they say that they want to deprecate the old version because of security issues and this is as I said, very surprising because the application was so broken that that seemed to be the only way to go. Just, you know, deprecate the old version, make it completely new and correct from the first time. And they, you know, say sorry for this inconvenience and that you please update and that they continue to strengthen their security. And then after the deadline of the responsible disclosure, Citizen Lab publishes their report and press release in different languages with our technical report attached and so on. 
And that also got some media attention in uh, Western media as well as uh, Korean media. But it was kind of underwhelming. There was not that much controversy about it as we were hoping for. If something like this would happen in probably Germany, then I feel like a lot more people would be outraged about it, but this went kind of just under. It was very few people reporting about it and no real outcry about it. So we kind of felt like that we provided Moiva with a free pen test. Instead of providing or taking down an application that is monitoring and uh, invading the privacy of the children, we felt like we improved a surveillance application. And we felt bad for it, and it, it felt like it all backfired. So we were hurt, but ready for a second round. Now in the second round, I want you to just bear in mind, like in our first report, there were like 22 findings, right, 22. And this is what they fixed, four. Okay, what does that mean? 18 left, right? So the, what, what did they fix? They fixed what matters to them. So they fixed the web filtering contains that I showed before. They fixed the usage of SSL, that they started using SSL. Uh, the, you know, all the development leaks, the internal URLs, all that kind of stuff, and an XSS that we found on the, on the website. Right, and that's about it. What's missing here? The Bully API, okay, among the other uh, 18 findings. Now, I said that they fixed SSL, but on Android, like, there's this cool thing that you can, like, override, like, how, you know, things are supposed to work. And you can, like, say, well, if you receive an SSL error, like, what the hell, like, proceed anyway, you know? Because why not? And if there's, you know, if you try to verify a host, then just, just, just return true, like, you know? Just return true, like, don't make it complicated, just return true. Okay, so essentially, yeah, they were using SSL, okay, we'll give them that. But you can like, using a, any like self-signed certificate, you can mine in the middle all the traffic of the application and the application will not complain and everything will go, will go through. And of course, no pinning at all as well. So, you know, a little bit better, but yeah, now, this is the Bully API 2.0. So this is the original endpoint, and this is the new endpoint, OK? It's very original. Now, the other thing that we have to emphasize here is that they never deprecated this old API. So this, like, to this day, our reports are public, and you can like, query this API and do like, all the things that we showed in the report, because they still work and wasn't fixed. And the old API is still there. And then the new uh, API is like vulnerable to the same things, but in a slightly different way. Uh, so this is the new API. So what's different here? Uh, same, well, this like the keys on the phone. This is the encrypted uh, message. And then this is the old message with the XOR stuff. So they were still using uh, the old way of sending this JSON request to the API with the same XOR algorithm and the same key, but they were uh, encrypting it with AES and, you know, return this, this thing and then just sending the, the encrypted part. So, but again, since this is on the phone, you can, you know, encrypt and decrypt and do anything you want. And because it accepts self-signed certificates, you can mine the middle traffic. So we are like on square one, like it wasn't really properly fixed. Now. On the Bully API, there was, there was a small difference. So like everything kept working. So you give the, you know, the target victim child, you give the phone number to the API, it gives you the parent, then you ask for the password, and then this was different. Instead of giving you the four digit password, which again is like a joke to brute force, um, it will give you this asterisk. But of course, you could change like the, the user agent, and then it will give you like the proper password. So I think, we speculate that this is because in our report, like the proof of concept what was using curl. So they, they fix it so that when the user agent is curl, then we'll give you the asterisk. But if the user agent is like Chrome or IE or whatever, uh, then they'll give you a password. So that's how they fixed it. Now, of course, 
in the new API, another thing that's possible as well is to keep faking the usage, like what we showed before. So with knowledge of the victim phone number, you can like raise alert on the parent. So same thing. In summary, like another big pile of shit. And they fix what matters to them, the development leaks and all the, you know, website stuff. But they did not fix like the real serious like privacy and all the user security issues. And just seriously, don't take our word for it. It's, the report is public, it's here, so you can go read it and there's all the details there. And now Fabian will tell us about what happened after this second round. So Citizen Lab published their updated report with the new findings and the verification of the old issues that were still basically all there. And this time, Moiba again surprised us with a totally new reaction by pulling the application from the Android store. And they are kind of whining here in their press release about it, that they offered services for free uh, for 12 years now, and that 80% of the kids in school have now smartphones, and there's now this new law to protect them because it's very dangerous. And, but they decided to stop Smart Sheriff and please move on to another blocking services. And new news articles were written about the news that Smart Sheriff disappeared from the Play Store. And we were so stoked. We were celebrating internally. We felt like that we fought a little war against surveillance and monitoring, and you know we won against a huge company, and maybe we even changed the law at some point, and we joked about naming ourselves a lawmaker or something like this. Like we were super excited, a bit exarrogated of what we achieved, but we f we felt really good about it. But then something shady happened. So here, Citizen Lab updates their press release and saying that. Yes, Moiba removed Smart Sheriff application, but the Smart Sheriff API remains still available. Okay, well, give them some time to deprecate everything and shut it all down, but we know today that it's still up there and running. And why is it up still and running? It seems like Moiba has republished Smart Sheriff under a different name, which translates to Cyber Safety Zone, and it's again on the uh, Play Store or on the Korean Store, and it seems like that there are not much changes. So now it's the question, did we fail? Did we really take it down or did nothing really happen? So here's a screenshot from the Korean App Store where you can see like this new app, Cyber Relief or Cyber Safety Zone with this different logo. But those screenshots look very similar to the screenshots how Smart Sheriff looked like. And just to figure out the difference between Smart Sheriff and Cyber Safety Zone, we can now try to find together the differences. <laughs> like they changed the logo, it's not the hat anymore, it's now green, and some text here changed. So yeah, apparently not much really happened. Also while preparing for this talk and preparing the slides and researching a bit more, I visited the Moiba website a lot, and suddenly the old website disappeared. And this happened just like a month or maybe one and a half months ago. And this is their old website with the Smart Sheriff hat logo and because Sheriff is smart and so that was a flagship product, so heavily advertising Smart Sheriff. But if you now go to the website, they made a complete redesign. It looks now very sleek and I think this translates to the new name, Cyber Safety Zone. And I also want to point out that those pictures Seem look cute like a nice family, but it's also kind of creepy. It looks like this mom eavesdropping on her child. Or the other picture looks maybe like a happy family, but could be also seen as like this father taking control of all the hobbies and stuff his children are doing. But I mean, what do you expect from a surveillance application? Also, the, uh, the latest uh, press release here from March, uh, now they increase the password limit from four digits to nine digits. So they still work on their issues. Also, they offer now a new web login interface. And on the left, it's basically login for Smart Share for this new application Cyber Safety Zone. And on the right, Smart Dream, which we have briefly mentioned in the beginning, this other application uh, by, by Moiba. And this web interface, if you log in into Smart Sheriff, you will see again the different functionalities. And if you compare this to the original Smart Sheriff 
application, you can see that it's basically about the same features. It's about managing use time, managing apps, manage, ma managing websites. So if all the stuff before didn't convince you that it's still the same app and they just rebranded it, then I think now it's clear that it's really just the same app. So just to recap really quick, Smart Sheriff was renamed to Cyber Safety Zone. Moiba never deprecated the API and never really got rid of Smart Sheriff. They just renamed the app. And now it seems like they are trying to hide these issues and evade the bad press. And if you Google Smart Sheriff, all these negative news articles about them by just having this new app. But what's up with Smart Dream? Because that looked a little bit more scary. So here's the web interface for Smart Dream. And you know, it, the translation is a bit bad, but it will tell you in a second what, what it can do. So Smart Dream also comes in two modes. The first one is a parent mode where you can check blocked messages from the child if they contain a harmful word. And in the child mode, the application installs as an accessibility service and it's monitoring SMS messaging and KakaoTalk, which is a Korean, very popular Korean instant messaging service, and as well as Google searches. And I was curious, how can they access like third-party messages in KakaoTalk? And it's quite clever through this accessibility service because you would use this feature normally to provide some uh, text-to-speech functionality for people that need some accessibility features. So they abuse this to get access to the texts of this other application, this instant messenger, to be able to look for harmful words and log them just in case. And if you will then are a parent and you look on your phone, you can look at the messages logged by your child and this is how the web interface looks like with four messages logged. A few things to point out here is that they do censor the phone number that from which a uh, message originated, presumably to protect the privacy of the sender to you know, be not that invasive, but that is just cosmetic. The API itself knows about these phone numbers and returns the full phone numbers. And also here in the web interview, if you are a web security guy, you can guess why the H1 here is a bit bigger than all the other texts on here, but about that more in a second. So what do we do now? We would like to do a responsible disclosure just because there are potentially children involved as being the victims of this whole thing. And it's very trivial to just develop a bully application where a person can enter a phone number and really screw somebody over. But we know also that Moiba lied to us. They never fixed their security issues and now even went so far as being so awful as renaming this application and rebranding it, trying to evade this bad press. But then again, how can we still protect the privacy of the children if we just would drop it full disclosure out there? And that also didn't feel right ethically. So I don't really know. I think all versions are a bit, have their, can have their criticism. But in the end, uh, we go with the way that we will show you what is possible, show you a few of the issues without showing and without making a technical report public. And I'm in contact again with Citizen Lab to provide a responsible disclosure to Moiba, just also to protect us from some legal issues. So as some people have already guessed, the, the big written H1 was obviously an XSS issue on the web interface for Smart Dream. And the interesting thing about this is that First of all, you can just like write an SMS message with an XSS payload uh, to your friend, including uh, a bad word, so it gets logged by the service and the parent then gets XSS. But also, again, the whole application doesn't use any SSL, still all clear text, and most endpoints don't have any form of authentication or authorization. So just by knowing a phone number, you can push fake messages to the service and in a big scale, basically, XSS all the parents. But the way worse issue with Smart Dream is that you can access more than 700,000 stored messages from more than 55,000 children that are registered with the service. I know those, or I assume those are the numbers because when I was testing, you can see an identifier just simply incrementing every time when I stored a message or when I created a new child. 
so it's fair to assume that this is how much is, is stored. And this is just like a demo output of a script you can write to just enumerate all over all those messages and all those children. Uh, to protect, protect the privacy, those is just scrambled. It's all the Korean characters are replaced with random other Korean characters, and I censored a few of the numbers. But just to give you an idea how, how this could look like. Also, um, SmartDream tries to tag every message what the harmful word was. So it tagged these messages as blackmailing or harassment and stuff, but I mean, it's clear that probably most of these 700,000 messages are not these kind of messages. And this is probably the most offensive slide in our presentation because it contains more than 1,086 harmful words that Smart Dream is monitoring uh, in, if they are contained in a, in a text message or if they contain contained in a Google search and then they will log that request or log that message. And it's also very clear to assume that a lot of these words are very harmless. I didn't translate all of them, but I read like news headers that apparently the word beer is in it. So if you just write your friend about beer, then you get logged. Somewhere is also the, uh, up here is like the English word fuck. Um, I also saw that there's like the Korean word of for 18 years old. So if you would wish somebody happy birthday, that would get logged. Presumably, you know, to catch some age of consent sexual stuff, but a lot of harmful, harmless stuff is included in those 1,000 harmful words. So again, Smart Dream shows us that it's a big pile of poo. We found XSS, no SSL use, lock, lack of authentication and authorization, and um, you can access all those stored messages and uh, searches from, uh, from these children. It's also funny to point out that basically all these issues that we are telling you here about are very similar to Smart Sheriff. So even though we didn't tell Moira about these issues yet, they could just like uh, find and replace the initial report with Smart Sheriff to Smart Dream and it would basically be the same thing. So we informed them about these kind of issues with the initial report, but they never care to address this issue with Smart Dream just showing again how much they don't care and how they are only acting trying to get the marketing a bit straight. And now, Abraham, just a note for reflection. Yeah, so I know this is difficult, okay, but make an effort. I'm going to ask you a question, but I want you to take a, to take a step back, take a deep breath, and pretend that this was somehow perfectly secure. Like, imagine that we didn't find any problems, that these applications that log messages and control, you know, where parents control children and all this, that this was somehow magically secure, like perfectly secure, like all traffic, all the protocols and everything and the APIs, uh, it was secure, right? Just imagine that for a second. I know it's difficult, but make an effort. And now, would you trust like any government or any company right, to have that kind of information, like a database of an entire country with the phone number and who is, like, all the children, you know, for that parent and all the messages that have been logged and all this. Like, would any of you trust a government or a company to store all that information? Anybody? Nobody, right? So, like, the whole concept, like, is, is flawed, like, you know, by design, yeah. So what's going to happen next? I already briefly mentioned that we are now in process of responsibly disclosing the technical details again of these issues to Moiba. And I will join Citizen Lab this year to, uh, in, in a couple of weeks where we will sit together and do some additional research looking at um, maybe some of the other operators' um, applications. And Citizen Lab and, Citizen Lab and Open at Korea are preparing for a new release, and this time we hope that we can work a bit better together with the media to get um, the attention of the Korean public. But also there's some stuff you can do, because this attention that this issue needs comes from people that look into these and write more articles about it. So if you know Korean security researchers, journalists, or activists, tell them about the story so they can, you know, 
stir some controversy inside of Korea, because we are just outsiders. If you want to, you can also have a look at the other child protection applications. I think it makes a great university project. You have like this interesting uh, like motivation to look into these and may, might be a cool thing to do with a university class as a project. And if you find then stuff, you know, relay it to Citizen Lab and Open Net Korea or some other organization. And then again, of course, support these organizations that try to fight against these kind of laws on, um, on a different level. Especially Open Net Korea was using the technical reports from SmartSheriff to raise this issue as a human rights issue at the United Nations um, Human Rights Commission, I think. So to get there, um, a discussion started on a political level so to maybe tell Korea maybe it's not a good idea to have such a law. And we want to end this presentation with a quote from a f Korean friend of mine. He said, I have learned how virtualization works by hiding porn inside of VMware in the early 2000s and never got busted. And what he says gives me hope that in the light of increasing surveillance, monitoring, and self-censorship, some bright kids might discover what it means to be a real hacker. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Did you also look at the iOS app, if there was one? So oh, the stuff about iOS is also funny. So SmartSheriff has an iOS version, which we haven't looked at yet, which is also a good candidate to be looked at in the summer then. But we have also heard from Korean teenagers that they preferably buy an iPhone because the monitoring capabilities that an application can have are less intrusive on iOS than they are on Android. So a lot of them like to buy iPhones because of that reason. Yeah. So for example, Smart Dream does not exist in an iOS version. Well, I guess the answers kind of know, but was there anything politically yet in Korea like uh, against the law? Or not? We have not heard much. We, we had some rumors in the beginning, especially after the first round where, where we were celebrating a lot that this app got pulled because we heard some rumors that now there was actually some political change. But in the end, that was just some political purse people trying to, you know, protect themselves or, you know, appease the public. So as far as I know, there has been no change or no update yet. Um, but I, we hope that with this new disclosure now that there's a bigger pressure on the Korean government. And I think they are also getting into um, uh, the election soon. So this, we try to you know, get this moment now right to put some additional pressure on the political parties. We have some demos as well that maybe we can run while we take questions. So this is just like how the password leak worked. Um, oh, that is not on the screen. Oh, no? Ah, because of the presenter. Yeah. Any other questions? Or OK. Maybe if I close this? Yeah, doesn't matter. OK, thank you very much. Uh, we will be around a little bit longer if you like to discuss some of the stuff in person. Or just contact us. We are happy to get some feedback on it. Thank you. Thank you.